Hello, and welcome to the month of Spooky 2022. Scary stories are a part of life. We've been telling them since the dawn of man over campfires, radio broadcasts, television, and these days, social media. They remind us of our own mortality, get our adrenaline going, and send chills through our bodies that, well, we just can't explain. During this month, you can expect the unexpected, hear the unbelievable, and witness stories that will stretch your imagination. Why? Because that is what we do here at Ron's Amazing Stories. So settle in for the spooky and be prepared to be taken away from today. Another five minute mystery. This five minute mystery is being brought to you by. Now hold on. What? Is this FFM going to be spooky or not? Are you a monster? I am. Then it's already spooky by virtue of you being here. So that is a no, then? It is. Sometimes, Jed, I wish I'd never taken this job as sheriff. I know what you mean. Take today, Memorial Day. Everybody else is sitting around their house taking things easy like... Or else out boating or having a picnic. That's right, enjoying themselves. But us, we're sitting around a stuffy old office. Yep, waiting for something to happen. Like vultures. I could think of a lot pleasanter things I'd rather be... I'll get it. Probably my wife. Green County Sheriff's Office. Who? Tom Edson's farm. Shot? Tom Edson shot by your wife? We'll be right out. As you can see, Sheriff, my wife Edith is hysterical. She's in no condition to answer questions. I didn't kill Dad. I didn't. I didn't. You know I didn't, Ronald. Jed. Yep, Sheriff. As soon as you finish that sketch and notes on the position of the body... You'd better call Doc Ferris. That's a good idea. Edith should be placed under a doctor's care immediately. She's been building up to this collapse for some time. You must believe me. I didn't kill Dad. I wasn't even in the house. You weren't in the house? No. I was in the stables talking to the horses when I, I heard the shots and ran back to the house. Edith, darling, you know you were in the room kneeling by your father when I came into the house, weren't you? Oh, yes, Ronald. And you had the gun in your hand, didn't you? Yes. Yes, Ronald, but I, I didn't kill Dad. You see, Sheriff? Ah, uh, looks bad. Tom Edson never approved of Edith's marriage to me, Sheriff, and because of that, Edith and I had never been in here during the ten years we've been married. This is our first visit. I've called the doc, Sheriff. He'll be right out. Good. Oh, uh, another thing, Sheriff. I noticed the automatic, the murder weapon, had a peculiar odor about it. Did? Yep. Smells something like powder or perfume. Mm. It's Edith's gun. She carried it in her purse. You know how things in a woman's purse always smells like their face powder? Yeah. Edith and her father had been arguing all morning. Then when I heard the postman blow his whistle, uh, you know how he blows a little whistle on these country routes when he leaves mail? Well, it was a relief to get out of the house, after I walked all the way out that long lane to the mailbox, there wasn't anything there but a couple of bills. While I was walking back, I heard shots of... Ronald, how can you stand there and so calmly convict your own wife? Sheriff, I didn't kill my father. I know you didn't, Edith. Now I know that Ronald is the murderer. On what clues does the sheriff place his accusation that Ronald is the murderer? Do you know? We'll be back in one minute with the solution. In the meantime... Well, I knew that Ronald was the murderer from the very start. Oh? Is that because people named Ronald are usually unsavory types? Funny. No, it has to do with the postal system and a very famous movie. Do tell us. Well, the movie is the 1946 The Postman Always Rings Twice. And of course, what the sheriff said. And that was? It was Memorial Day. Brilliant. You really have solved this one. 
Are you mocking me? Whenever and wherever possible. You really are... Amazing. I was going to say exasperating. And now, back to our mystery. Ronald, maybe mail doesn't mean much to you big city folks. You maybe don't pay much attention to its delivery. But we farmers appreciate our mail and know all about deliveries. You couldn't have heard the mailman's whistle and gone out for the mail, Ronald, because today is Memorial Day, a national holiday, and mail isn't delivered on national holidays. However, holiday or not, I'm going to deliver you to the county jail immediately. Well, it's the county jail for Ronald. I was right. Lucky guess. If you hadn't seen that movie, and if I wasn't British, I would have solved that one. Must you always be so persnickety? It is my nature to be what I am. And it's my nature to be right. Welcome to the podcast. We have another week of the spooky, and this time we go full throttle on the horror. Really? What kind of stuff? We head into the dream world with two great stories from you guys. A phantom boy in a barn, and a ghost invades Elena's dreams. That should just about do it. But there's more. Our featured story is about a vengeful witch on a killing spree. <gasps> And we'll end with a very special Johnny Is It True? Ghost Stories edition. Amazing. I wouldn't have it any other way. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks, and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? Real Ghost Stories Halloween Hauntings by Eve S. Evans and Roger Harrell. It is said that Halloween is the night where spirits roam and feel free to be amongst the living. The only thing is you have no idea where they'll be. Will they choose your house, your work, or the other side of your bed? Who can say? Here's a sample from the book of what you can expect. This story is titled The Skeleton on the Wall. I pulled the covers over to my chin, too scared to do much else. The scraping seemed to get near the door, then it was like it started to move up the wall. The noise seemed to get louder as it got higher and higher. It filled the room. I was hoping my mom and dad would hear it and come and save me from whatever this was. But I didn't think anyone was coming somehow. I knew I was the only one hearing the noise in my room. The dragging, scraping sound seemed to move above my door. Then it stopped. Somehow, the silence was worse than when the noise was there. At least then I knew where it was. This way could be anywhere. I could feel the air get heavier in the room, and the shadows near the door seemed to swirl together and take shape. First it took the shape of a human skull. Then it was like every vertebrae formed one by one out of the shadows. Next came the ribs, 
the pelvis bones, then the arms. It began to crawl around the wall above my door, its eyes never leaving my own. The fact that it didn't have any legs only added to the grotesque figure on the wall. It clawed at the wall, dragging itself along, which explained the noise it made. It seemed to shift and began moving up towards the ceiling. Could this thing really get up there? I hope not. My hopes were quickly dashed when it seemed to suspend upside down in the air and began to crawl towards me. If I could have screamed or ran, I would have, but I was so afraid I was pinned to my bed. It got closer and closer until it was nearly right above me. It began to reach one of its hands out, trying to grasp and claw at my face. I pushed myself as far away on my bed as I could, but it only advanced further along the ceiling. Finally, it got right above me, and it turned its head completely backwards and stared right at me. Suddenly, it let go of the ceiling and began to fall right towards me. I knew I wasn't going to be able to move fast enough. I gritted my teeth and squeezed my eyes shut as tightly as I could. I waited for the bone claws to sink into me. But nothing happened. I waited a full twenty seconds before I was willing to open my eyes. I looked everywhere, but I couldn't see anything. The room was silent. No scraping. No dragging. I didn't know what had happened. The skeleton was right there. I had seen it fall right towards me. I spun around, sure it was on the wall behind me, but the wall was empty. I was so tired from the fear and all I could do was lay back down on my side. Silent sobs racked my entire body as I tried to process what I had just experienced. But how can a girl of only eight years old come to grips with that kind of nightmare? Despite how tired I was, sleep still eluded me. The next morning, I didn't even bother trying to tell my mom or dad what I had seen the night before. They wouldn't believe me, and I don't blame them. Had it not happened to me, I wouldn't believe it either. Real Ghost Stories is a collection of 20 tales that should make you shiver just a bit. It takes you from Grandma's haunted house to a roommate who just isn't there. You'll hear about moving tree limbs and wailing women. Each tale reminds you that you may not be alone. Stephen Lowell narrates this one and he does a fantastic job. He uses just the right amount of voice acting to make you feel what you hear. And what you will hear are some of the creepiest real-life paranormal encounters that have happened around Halloween. Now, if that appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories and you can have Real Ghost Stories Halloween Hauntings for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This also grants you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly with new titles. So, to download your free audiobook today, Go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. And now it's time for more of your spooky stories. These are your stories sent by you for you. Our first story comes from Tilton, New Hampshire, and was sent in by Gregory Morrison. This is a strange tale, and I can honestly say that I can relate to it. I had a bout with lucid dreaming a few years ago that left me with some very strange stories. Greg has titled his, The Boy in the Pole Barn. Hello, Ron. Thank you for the podcast and your request for stories. I guess I was one of those guys who said, oh, somebody else will do it. I guess that has not been the case lately. I live in the tiny town of Tilton. 
this small New Hampshire getaway is known as the gateway to the lakes region. We are pretty backward and rural, but change has been coming and the old ways have been replaced. My wife's cousin Adam, rest his soul, and his friends were living in one of the last homes remaining on Main Street. They were able to rent it for a time before the house was sold for commercial property. It was an old colonial with a pole barn attached to the rear. Gotta tell you, I've spent some party time in that barn. It was pretty empty, but there were a few remaining items from previous owners. One of these was a wall-hung photo of a toddler boy playing with a couple of toys. One peculiar afternoon after arriving to pick up Adam, I waited in the pole barn for him to get ready. There was a punching bag there that I could get my blood flowing a bit. Only a few punches landed before I noticed that the child's photo and frame were broken, lying on the floor. Intrigued, I walked over to get a closer look. As I picked it up, the hair on the back of my neck peaked and my heart rate rose on high alert. In my mind, I wavered between thinking myself fearful and knowing that I wasn't alone in that barn. Trying to ease myself back into the bag, I couldn't focus, so I decided to leave. While walking swiftly back to the main house, I felt a poke on the back of my hand. Shocked, I looked and saw blood dripping from it. My head swirled. How did I do that? Did I do that? I looked around and there was nothing that could have poked me. But I felt as if something or someone was laughing at me. I couldn't explain it. In the main house, I met Adam and asked what happened to the photo. He explained that he and his friends got freaked out by it one night and proceeded to smash it to relieve their anxiety. He added that he hasn't been able to stay alone in the barn for more than a few minutes ever since. I told him what happened to me and showed him my hand. There was a short slice on the back of it. It looked like it had been made by a jagged piece of glass. I got bandaged up and we left. I hated myself for my lack of bravery and for the little boy whose home would soon be torn down. It was less than a week later, in a dream state, I was pulled into what my wife called a wormhole. It was a quick movement through a tunnel. It was windy. It was loud. And now I was staring into that pole barn from up above. I didn't see the boy, but I knew he was there. I suppose it was my instincts that kicked in. All I could think to do was to tell the boy he needed to leave. I was yelling at the top of my lungs, trying to outshout the wind. I even tried to make gestures to warn the child. Then I was pulled back out and back home to my bedroom. My wife was holding me, trying to wake me up. I know this makes no sense, but strangely I feel like I accomplished my purpose. I don't know if what happened was real or not, but I like to think that I helped the spirit of that boy move on. Gregory Morrison, Tilton, New Hampshire Like I said at the top, I know how it feels to have a lucid dream. It is so hard to know if it really happened, and it feels so real. In one dream that I had, I was taken to a cave. I could feel the dark, dank, and humidity of it. I walked around looking for the entrance. When I found it, it opened into the ocean, and at the mouth of the cave was a pirate ship. I was excited, and I so wanted to board it. Unfortunately, like you, I was whisked away in a whirlwind never to experience what was aboard that ship. Thank you, Greg, for sharing your story with us. Our second story for this week comes from Alina Florence, who, by strange coincidence, lives in Florence, Italy. She says her mother is Italian, but her dad was born in New York. Because of her dual citizenship, she loves American podcasts. She continues our dream theme with a story that she has titled, Let Me Go. I've often dreamed of ghosts since I was young. 
First of all, I do not mistake the person in my dream for the ghosts that invade my dream. Let me explain. I have dreams about ghosts that I know are dreams. Then I have dreams where I am invaded by a ghost. I had such a dream when I wasn't feeling well. Something grabbed me by the arms. I was asleep, but I felt awake. Something grabbed me and pulled me down. I thought it was a dream, so I just let it go. But something kept dragging me down. I realized I shouldn't be dragged away, so I started resisting, trying to pull off what had caught me. It felt like hands, and they wouldn't let me go. I started to panic, and I was filled with fear. Then I felt anger, and I yelled, Let me go, in my dream. Nothing. I shouted it for a second time. Still nothing. Maybe I was very desperate, but I really opened my mouth and shouted, Let me go! Now I'm fully awake, and it lets me go. My husband was out watching television, and he came running into the bedroom. I told him what happened, but he assured me that he knew the whole story already. I guess he heard it play out in real time. This was not the last time those creepy hands would touch my shoulder while I was sleeping. Every time they do, I wake up with goosebumps. Elena Florence, Florence, Italy Well, Elena, thank you for sharing your story. Again, I can fully understand how you feel. I think the rock group Heart put it best in their song. These dreams go on when I close my eyes. Every second of the night, I live another life. Sweet dreams, Elena. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com. Click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured spooky story comes again from the list of the most 33 scariest stories from the golden age of radio. This time, we'll play number 21. It comes from the Hyman Brown series, The Inner Sanctum. Today, we tend to remember The Inner Sanctum best for the searing, sardonic antics and bad puns of its crypt keeper like host, Raymond. The stories were normally campy and even kind of fun, but every now and then they ventured into the realm of the truly horrific. Like our grisly story for today, an old hag burned as a witch centuries ago returns from the grave to exact retribution. The story is titled The Vengeful Corpse and it aired Halloween night, 1949. inner sanctum mystery and remind you to I'd like you to meet some new guests we've just dug up. Now, that peculiar cadaver standing off the corner by himself has a serious case of claustrophobia. Mm -hmm. Poor stiff. He just can't stand shrouds. (laughs) 
Now, this fellow here, right, was a mountain climber in life. He took his wife on an alpine hike, and while they were going up an icy slope, he cut the rope that held them together. Said he just couldn't stand being tied to one woman. And now, greet our most forgettable character, Wild-Eyed Willie. One day, Willie's ugly wife bit him. So, in anger, he buried her in the backyard. Six months later, his homely mate came up as a dogwood tree to haunt him. Now, according to Willie, her bark is much worse than her bite. <laughs> Tonight's inner sanctum mystery, The Vengeful Corpse, was written by Ed Adamson and Bob Sloan, and stars Barbara Weeks in the role of Sarah, with Carl Swenson as Paul. Inner Sanctum is presented by the Emerson Drug Company of Baltimore, Maryland, makers of Bromo Seltzer. Remember, Bromo Seltzer is compounded by registered pharmacists. It fights headache three ways. Bromo Seltzer helps your headache quickly, pleasantly. And it also soothes the upset stomach and jangled nerves that may team up with it. No wonder druggists report that of all headache products dispensed to their fountains, the overwhelming favorite is Bromo Seltzer. Please, friends, absolute silence. We want it so quiet you can hear a head drop. In the small hillside New England cemetery... A chill evening wind stirs the leafless trees with a complaining murmur. A blood-red moon probes through the branches with grotesque fingers, touching the faded headstones with their eerie light. The frail, drawn-faced young woman sits on an old stone bench, listening acutely to the rustling of the branches, as if to capture some word whisper of the dead, forgotten past. Sarah! Sarah! doing out here anyway? I was called out here, Paul. What? The wind. There was a voice on the wind and it called me to come out here. That's just in your mind, darling. No voice called you. Yes, Paul, it did. I recognized the voice. You recognized it? Then whose voice was it, dear? It was old, retired, and sort of cracked. And yet I could recognize it as my own voice. You heard your own voice? Yes, Paul. And it was strongest right here where I'm sitting now, among my family graves. Hello, Willie. Oh, that voice. Hello. It's just Mr. Griffin, the caretaker. I asked him to help me look Hello. for you. Oh, well, I see you found your wife all right, eh, Mrs. Seaton? Yes, I found her, Mr. Griffin. I thought I saw Mrs. Seaton come to the graveyard here earlier. I didn't expect she'd still be... Oh, well, what's wrong? What's the matter, Mr. Griffin? Just that I get sort of a funny kind of feeling every time I pass this grave here. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Uh, that grave, that one there, the one right next to you. Why? What's the matter with it? Well, ain't you noticed there's only one name on the headstone? Uh, the first name, Hester. That's strange. My family name is Randolph. Wasn't this woman a Randolph? Oh, you don't know the story? Uh, what story are you talking about? Uh, the kin who buried this Hester woman didn't think she deserved the family name, so they left it off the headstone. Why? Why didn't they give Hester her full name? Because they didn't want anybody to know who she was, I guess. You see, Hester was burned at the stake for witchcraft. Witchcraft? Uh -huh, that's what they say. Uh, Mr. Griffin, my wife is an ill woman as it is. Let I him go on, Paul. No, but Sarah... What I... else, Mr. Griffin? Well, that's all, Mrs. Seaton, except that Hester claimed at the stake that they were burning an innocent woman. She could be heard shouting it as the flames licked around her. She threatened with her last breath to get even someday. How could she get even? I don't know, but according to the story I heard, Hester said that this here town owed her the years of her life that they took away. Well, now, this is completely ridiculous. It's only a Mr. legend. Mr. Griffin, no... tell me, how many years ago did all this happen? Well, it, it's right here on the headstone, you see. Hester, a lost soul, born October the 13th, 1759. Died. Good heavens. What's wrong? Well, look, Mrs. Seaton. The date of Hester's death. It's worn away. Sarah? Yes, yes, Paul. What are you doing 
out of bed. When did you get up? Why, just a minute ago, I... I can't sleep. She keeps calling me. I hear her voice right here in this room. Just, just a few minutes ago. What? She was begging me to help her, telling me she never really lived and pleading with me to bring her back to life. No, Sarah. You... I thought I saw her. No, Sarah, believe me. She was dressed in a black dress and there was a large W on it. That's the witch. And in her hand, she held a flaming torch. I'm going to call the doctor, darling. This is not... Someone's at the door. All right, I'll see who it is. No, wait, wait. I'll go. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Seaton. Why, Judge Foster. I hope I didn't awaken you folks. I saw a light in the window. Oh, so that's I... all right, Judge. Come right in. Ah, thank you. I'm sorry to bother you this time of the night, Mr. Seaton, but I was looking out of my window on the other side of the cemetery, and I thought I saw something or someone prowling around out there, and I wondered if they come over this way. Who was it? Oh, I don't know. Someone carrying a torch. A torch? Uh, go on, Judge. Well, of course, it could be that my eyes were playing tricks on me. They're not so good. But uh, as far as I could make out, it was a woman dressed in black. Oh. You saw this woman, Judge? You're sure? Well, I'm pretty sure I saw her. Of course, it's kind of dark out there, but it looked to me like there was something on the front of her dress. What? What do you mean? Well, there was the letter W. A big white letter W on it. It was Hester, just as No, I... no, Sarah. Hester? Who's Hester? Hester Randolph. That's who you saw. She was in this house, No, too. it must be a trick. You see, someone is trying to frighten you to make you worse. Now, now, hold on, folks. Hester Randolph was buried over a hundred years ago. She's come back to life. Mrs. C. Uh, now... Judge, my wife is ill. She doesn't realize what she's saying. I know Hester's alive. You didn't believe me, Paul, but Judge Foster saw her, too. Well, I didn't see anybody who's been dead a hundred years. What is it, Judge? Don't you smell it? Yes. Something burning. This is the odor of burning flesh. Look. Out there on the back lawn. Stuck in the earth. A torch. A flaming torch. <laughs> Sir, I tell you, it's useless to have me dig up this crane. I've got the note, Paul. It's the only way I'll be sure. Now, careful, Mr. Seaton. You're just about deep enough for the coffin now, if it's still there. Judge, I don't know how you can sanction a thing like this. Well, Mr. Seaton, you see, I want to be sure, too. Yeah, but it's ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, well, you've struck wood with the shovel. Yes, it's the coffin, all right. You better go easy now. That wood is soft with age and half rotted away. Ah. Oh, I think we can open it now. Wait, I'll give you a hand with the lid. All right. There's something inside it. The body. Charred. It's a body, all right. Only it isn't a woman's. You can still make out the face. It's Griffin, the caretaker. <laughs> Dr. Norton, I am so glad that you've gotten here. I came as soon as I could, Mr. Seaton. What's wrong? She's worse, Doctor. Oh? Much worse. Been in her room all day, hiding like a frightened child. I, I think the me uh, reading made her worse. Reading? What reading? Well, for the past few days, she's been reading books about her family history. Why did you let her have them? Well, because at first, they seemed to quiet her. Since the night we found Mr. Griffin's body in that grave, she's wanted to know more and more about Hester Randolph. Oh. oh, Sarah. Uh, Dr. Norton's here, dear. You, you've got to warn him, Paul, before it's too late. Warn who, Mrs. Seaton? Judge Foster. He's in danger. Hester will kill him next. What? It's in the records of the court. The magistrate who sentenced Hester to death at the stake was a man named Foster. Now, Mrs. Seaton, you're just upset. Please, believe me. Judge Foster is a direct descendant of that magistrate. Sarah, Sarah. Hester's dead, dear. The dead can do no harm. Oh. Killed one man already, and now she's going to kill another. She swore she'd get that revenge on the magistrate and on the man who was her accuser. Mrs. Seaton, all this took place over a hundred years ago. Then what about Mr. Griffin? Well, what do you mean, sir? He had the same name, too. According to the record, Hester's accuser was a man named Richard Griffin. <laughs> So, Judge Foster, my wife insisted that I come over here, and 
warn you about, Hester. Well, thank you, Mr. Seaton, for troubling, but I'm not a bit worried about the similarity of names. Well, I didn't admit it to Sarah, but the coincidence with Griffin was strange. Oh, the dead never frightened me, Mr. Seaton. But thank you for coming over. Oh, by the way, can I drive you home? No, thanks. Dr. Norton is waiting for me outside. Good night. Good night, Mr. Seaton. Now, uh, uh, oh, where did I put those glasses of mine? Oh, sure, I left them here on the table. Wait. Say, who opened that door? Is, is that you come back, Mr. Seaton? Well, confound it, whoever it is, answer me. Who's out there? What? Who, who is it? What? Who, who are you? Your conscience has been dimmed by the evil of your acts. Who am I? Mark you well this torch I light. Now mark you also, my God. This black garment I wear and upon which you had impressed the wicked lips. Stop with you. Hester. I, Satan's magistrate, Hester Randolph. <laughs> Listening to Inner Sanctum, brought to you by. Glad we've got some Bromo Seltzer home. More and more people are turning to Bromo Seltzer all the time because it fights headache fast and fights it all three ways. First, it quickly fights the pain of the headache itself. Then it soothes upset stomach and jumpy nerves that may often team up with a headache. That's right, folks. Bromo Seltzer does three jobs. Fast and pleasantly. Just put a teaspoonful of bromo seltzer in a glass and add water. It fizzes immediately, sparkling and refreshing, ready to help your headache all three ways. Why wait, folks? Keep that familiar blue bottle handy at home and at your place of business. Yes, friends, it's smart to be prepared for headaches at all times with bromo seltzer. It's on sale at all drugstores. Get a bottle today or tomorrow. Simply ask for... You know, that's the way a dame gets when she's burned up. Makes a specter of herself. Mm. You know, folks, I kind of feel sorry for old Judge Foster. When Hester showed up, the poor guy didn't know which way to turn. Uh, I mean, to turn away which which. They should have believed Sarah Seaton. She sure had Hester dead, or rather alive, to write. Yes, indeed. It's a wise descendant who knows her own forebears, particularly the grave-minded one. Mm. <laughs> well, now, let's get back to our flaming fable and see what's cooking for the next stanza. Paul. Paul, wake up. Mm. Paul, please, wake up. Oh, sir. What's the matter, darling? I've just had a terrible dream. I'm afraid. No, you... I dreamt that Judge Foster was killed tonight by Hester. You did warn Judge Foster, didn't you, Paul? Yes, yes, of course, sir. <clears throat> Where are you going, dear? I'm getting dressed. I'm, I'm going down to tell the judge myself. You are staying here. Oh, please, now, please let me go. It means a man's life. You heard what Dr. Norton said, dear. Under no circumstances are you to leave the house. You're to talk to no one. Why am I being kept here like a prisoner? Why don't you let me speak to... Oh, what, what was that? Sounded like a door banging in the wind. Yes. There it is again. In the rear of the house. Didn't you lock that back door? Mm -hmm. I'm sure I did. I'd better see what happened. Wait. I'm going with you. I'd better turn on a light here in the kitchen. No, you won't have to. I can see. It's the door, all right. Guess I must have forgotten to spring the latch back. Paul! Sarah, what's the matter? Out there. By the trees at the end of the lawn. I thought I saw a figure. All right, just stay here, dear. I'll be right back. Someone out here, Sarah. You sure? Positive. Probably just a shadow. Oh! There is someone right here! Sarah! Sarah! What happened? Sarah. Where are you? Sarah! 
She was standing here, Sheriff. Right here at the back door when I heard her scream. And there wasn't a sign of her when you got back here at the door? Not a sign of her. Well, folks just don't vanish into thin air, Mr. Seaton. She must be around here someplace. I got to find her before it's too late. Too late? What do you mean by that? I, I don't know, really. I, I, I have a feeling that... Oh, now, you're not going to tell me about dead witches returning, too, are you? Don't tell me you believe in that stuff. I don't know what to believe. Sheriff, is that you, Sheriff? Yes, who's there? Dr. Norton. You'd better come with me, Sheriff. I just discovered something on the side of the road, about a mile away. Mr. Seaton, I... I think you'd better wait here. What is it, Dr. Norton? What have you found? I... Rather you'd wait, as I said before, until we're sure. What are you trying to hide from me? I guess you'd better speak up, Doctor. If it's something that concerns Mr. Seaton, maybe he should know. All right, Sheriff. When I made the turn into the road, my headlights caught it in a ditch. I wasn't sure at first, so I stopped the car and got out. There was a body in the ditch. A charred body. Sheriff, over here to the right. Where, where, where is she? Easy now, Mr. Seaton. Right. right here, Sheriff. Now, wait, I'll switch on the flashlight. There. Sarah. Wait. Just a moment, Mr. Seaton. Dr. Norton has made a mistake. What? This corpse isn't your wife. I can tell by that ring. It's the ring that Judge Foster always wore. <laughs> Hello. Oh, yes, Sheriff. Any news yet? Well, why can't your men find her? It's been six hours already. No, I haven't heard a word. Yes. Please call me as soon as you hear anything, will you? Who's there? Who is it? Oh, open the door. Hurry. Sarah. Yes, yes, please let me in. Oh, Sarah, Sarah, thank the Lord you're all right. Oh, Darling, where have you been? What happened to you? Wait, lock the door quickly. You... She, she doesn't know I've come back. She's still looking for Who? me. Hester. She was out there, Paul. That's why I ran from the house. She called to me from the road. Maybe go with her. Uh, go where? To the cemetery. She kept me there, torturing me, begging me to change places with her. Darling, you're not making a stand. Please, please, believe me. We've got to get away from here tonight, right now. She'll kill me if we don't. She wants my life for the one she never lived. Now, stop it. Stop. Uh, now, get hold of yourself. There is no such woman as Hester Randolph. I saw her. I spoke to her. But the woman you saw is somebody else, somebody living, who wants you to believe that she's Hester. She wants everybody to believe it. But why, Paul? Why? Because she's a cold-blooded murderess. She's killed two people already, and she's trying to drive you out of your mind completely. But then who? Who could it be? I wasn't sure before. Now I'm almost positive. Dr. Norton. Dr. Norton? Now, you saw this, Hester, Sarah. What was she like? Oh, like a ghost. Hmm? Like a shadow in the light. You, you can see her face, and yet you can see through it. Beyond. No. That was just an illusion created by the night there. Oh. And perhaps some other tricks of a clever, scheming woman. You'll see. I'll prove that Dr. Norton is... That's the... the back door. That's blown open again. Leave it. We've got to get out of here. No, no, you stay here. I'm going to see who opened that door. Please, hurry. Don't leave me alone so long. Please, not for the moment. Paul! Oh. Ah, what, what is it, Sarah? Don't come in here. Don't come back. Run, run away as fast as you can. What's the matter? Don't come in here. Leave here. Yes, sir. Sarah! anymore. I killed Hester. She came toward me and I fired. Sarah, there's no one in this room, dear. Over there. In the hall. She's there. Where? I don't see it. Good Lord, you've broken the mirror. What? You shot at yourself. No. It can't be. 
I can't be her. And yet I saw her face. But it was my face, too. Sarah. It was you. You all the time. I am Hester, fair gentleman. It is warming to have such a friend as you to stand beside me in this mockery of justice. Oh, Sarah, Sarah. Run. Run as fast as you can, Paul. I was wrong. I haven't killed her. Run. Sarah, I've got to help you. I've got to explain to you that... But I'm not, Sarah. Not anymore. Can't you see who I am? Can't you see who's taken my place? Sarah, listen to me. I love you. Please, please come back to me. Sarah is gone. Now I can live the years they took from me. Sarah. See in my hand this pistol. He will fit it, I say. He will come with me. Still no answer, Sheriff. No answer, Dr. Norton. I can't understand it. Mr. Seaton was home when I called just 15 minutes ago. I warned you, Sheriff, to have that house closely watched. Well, I can't do a hundred things at once. I've got every available deputy out looking for Mrs. Seaton. Don't you realize she may have gone back to their house? Don't you realize that she's the one who might be Hester? Mrs. Seaton? Hester? What the deuce are you talking about? I'm talking about dual personality. Mrs. Seaton is suffering from a nervous breakdown. And it's entirely possible that she's the one who killed Griffin and Judge Foster. Well, you should have told me this before, Doctor. Come on, we're getting right over to the Seaton house. Here, Paul. They buried Hester's body here. Dishonored and unnamed. But, Paul, you believe in my innocence? Yes, sir. we better go back there. Back? Yes, to the house. Very cold here. It's cold everywhere, Paul. I feel the chill of death coming near me. You and I are going back. Back through time. To an age where no one can harm us. This torch I hold. To free us forever. No, wait. Now, Sarah, please, listen. Now, try to understand, Sarah. You... In your mind, the flames will be of no pain. I know. Because I've been through such a death before. No. Now, Sarah, wait. You... <laughs> What's the matter? Look, the, the headstone, I... I didn't notice that before. It's been recut. Oh, what do you mean? Well, don't you see what it says? Hester Randolph, a lost soul. Born October 13, 1759. Died September 12, 1949. <laughs> Have you had your personality split lately? <laughs> you see what happens when a dame gets her dates mixed up? Poor Hester. She didn't know whether she was coming or going to the grave. Now, look, if you should be in an old New England cemetery some night and one of the headstones should move, don't be frightened. It's probably just Hester coming up for a hot date again. <laughs> Oh, by the way, there's no parting moral attached to tonight's tale. I'll just leave you with your own thoughts. As horrible as I hope they are. <laughs> Friends, it's so foolish to suffer with an ordinary headache when Bromo Seltzer gives you such fast, pleasant, three-way relief. It's true, Mr. Weiss. Bromo Seltzer is so pleasant to take, and it works so fast to help your headache all three ways. Yes, Bromo Seltzer speedily fights the headache pain itself. Then it goes right to work to soothe the upset stomach and jangled nerves that often may team up with a headache. Try it next time you get a headache. Prove to yourself just how fast it works to help your headache all three ways. We've tried a lot of headache products, but it's Bromo Seltzer from now on for our family. You'll say the same thing, too, once you've discovered Bromo Seltzer. 
So get a bottle today and be prepared at all times to fight a headache fast all three ways. It's smart to keep Bromo Seltzer both at home and at your place of business. That's right, folks. Remember, Bromo Seltzer gives you fast three-way help for a headache. It's on sale at all drugstores. Caution, use only as directed. If headaches recur or persist, see your doctor. Get Bromo Seltzer today and... Five, three, three-way help. Time to close that squeaking door for another seven-day rest until next week at this time when Bromo Seltzer brings you another Inner Sanctum Mystery directed by Hyman Brown. (laughs) Until next Monday, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams. That was a creepy story with a creepy ending. Did you notice that this one still had its original commercials intact? The odd thing is that there were only a few that still have them. Why? The programs sponsored by Bromo Seltzer were re-released as AFRS recordings and the commercials were edited out. AFRS stands for Armed Forces Radio Service. That makes this Inner Sanctum one very rare recording. The program's familiar and framed audio trademark was the eerie creaking door which opened and closed the broadcasts. Hyman Brown got the idea from a door in the basement that squeaked like heck. The door sound was actually made by a rusty desk chair. The program did intentionally intend to use a door, but on its first use, the thing wouldn't creak. Undaunted, Brown grabbed a nearby chair, sat on it, turned, causing a hair-raising squeak. The chair was used from then on as the official sound prop. On one memorable occasion, a staffer innocently repaired and oiled the chair, thus forcing the sound man to mimic the squeak orally. How about that? Johnny, is this true? As you know by now, I like to surf the internet to find the strange and unusual. I do this in the name of the podcast, but the truth is, I would do it anyway, even if there was no podcast. What you're about to hear is... Johnny, is this true? I will tell you a story and then ask the question, did I make it up or is it true? Your job is to decide. Let's get started. Johnny, is this true? Over the last few weeks, I've been asking for your stories. You have responded, but a lot of you sent in some really short encounters. Really short. So, what to do with them? Then it came to me. Why not do a special Johnny, Is It True? to feature them. So, here is what we're going to do. I'm going to read four stories. But were they all sent in by you? Or did I take pen to paper and fake them? Your job is to guess. Here we go. Story 1 This was sent in by Michael Jackson from Encino, California. I was standing at the bus stop waiting for the 236 Metro local line. I was chatting with this older guy and he was saying some strange stuff about the war. When the bus arrived, I gathered my stuff and turned to say so long. There was no one there and I swear this happened. Well, Mike, I swear with a name like Michael Jackson, I must have made this one up. Did I? I did not. MJ did a bit of a thriller and took the bus, just like he said. 
story two. This one was sent in by Juanita Carpenter of Portland, Oregon. Ron, I swear this happened to me. I was asked to house sit for a friend of a friend. I do this all the time, and I've never had anything happen. Well, that all changed. I was settling in, getting to know the dogs. Then they just started running around the house, barking. I called the homeowner to ask about it. They told me not to worry. The dogs were just playing with the ghost. Oh my. Now, did I make this one up? I don't think I did, but you tell me. Nope. This again was a real email sent in via the story submission page. Whoa, crazy stuff. Story 3 Brandy Castro lives in Austin, Texas, and here is her story, or is it? Ron, I was camping with my boyfriend. We had brought some legal, medically approved cannabis with us. After a bit, I saw a man with no legs enter the tent. He looked around and then simply disappeared. Now, you probably think it was the weed, right? The problem was is that we hadn't partaken of any yet. True story. Well, Brandy, we'll let the people decide. Is this one true? Okay, it's a crazy event, but it is true. Brandy added that the man was dressed like some old prospector. You know, like what you see in the westerns. Story 4 Our last one comes from Bill Barker, who didn't say where he was from. Ron, did you know that the wind is a ghost? At least here it is. One evening after dinner, I was sitting outside in my favorite lawn chair. A breeze came up and swirled around me. Then out of nowhere, a voice said, I know your name. To which I said, What is it? He said, Billy. And then the wind stopped. For the record, I had chills. Well, Bill, that one is creepy. But is it a real story? Well, I can't answer that completely. But it was sent into the website and is quite creepy. That is, if you were to ask me. Okay, so I wasn't all that truthful at the start. I gave the impression that one of these stories could be fake. The truth is, they were all sent in by you. I want to thank Michael, Juanita, Brandy, and Billy for answering the call and sharing their stories with us. That's it for this time on Johnny, Is It True? That was episode number 564, and I have to thank Gregory Morrison, Alina Florence, and all the folks that took part in Johnny, Is It True? You all made the wheels on the bus turn round and round. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please, Leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.